Money. We all need it to cover our basic life necessities. But for thousands of people across the globe, money is largely inaccessible. Approximately 2.7 billion people live off of less than $2 a day and find themselves trapped in a cycle of poverty. Because these people possess no assets and hold no collateral, they're not qualified to secure loans from conventional banks and are therefore unable to lift themselves out of poverty. That is, unless they have the help of microfinancing. The idea of poverty alleviation is nothing new to the international community. National foreign aid distribution agencies and intergovernmental institutions like the UN and the IMF have existed for decades. In the private sector, a variety of nonprofit organizations have dedicated themselves exclusively to the resolution of this issue. Yet with these organizations, poverty alleviation is treated as an expenditure, a cost with a purely social benefit to the global community. On the other hand, microfinance institutions, which we'll refer to as MFIs, offer a more economically appealing solution to reduce poverty and enforce equal rights. Microcredit itself refers to the small-scale loans made out to individuals with no assets or collateral by an MFI. With these loans, recipients are able to carry out income-generating activities, enabling them to lift themselves out of poverty and participate to a greater extent in the global economy. Because microfinancing facilitates the poor in entrepreneurship and wealth accumulation, it not only engages a demographic that was previously excluded from the global economy, but it also expands the global market and increases the total number of agents within this complex adaptive system. As distinguished University of Michigan professor C.K. Prahala notes, once the people at the bottom of the wealth pyramid obtain the capacity to consume, a latent market will emerge, providing the private sector with a plethora of new opportunities to profit and offering the poor newly improved standards of living. But how is all of this possible? Wouldn't small-scale loans be too costly to provide to people who have no collateral and may default? Some microcredit organizations depend on government subsidies or donations to provide these loans. But because donor funds are not constant and could be withdrawn at any time, MFIs tend to seek financial sustainability. That is, they strive to cover their expenses using their own revenue rather than relying on donated funds. To ensure financial sustainability, most MFIs have implemented high interest rates on loans to generate revenue. This is essential for MFIs who do not accept subsidies since too low an interest rate would strain finances and eventually lead to bankruptcy. On the other hand, if interest rates are too high, it becomes more difficult for recipients to meet payments and potential clients become uneasy about taking out loans. A study performed by Cole, Kunt, and Murdoch found that once interest rates surpassed 60%, MFIs were no longer profitable since the demand for credit had decreased so dramatically. MFIs must therefore find a balance between their revenue-generating activities and the demand of their market. Because microcredit recipients hold no assets, MFIs must find other ways to guarantee high repayment rates in order to provide these loans. Group loans have provided the social pressure necessary to ensure just that. To receive a loan, groups must agree to encourage each member to meet payments on time, and in some cases, they must agree to joint liability in case an individual member defaults. This, combined with the appointment of a group leader to monitor repayments, creates a kind of social collateral for the group. Typically, these group loans are made out to women since studies have found that they are more likely to respond to the social pressures of the group and repay their loans. For these reasons, Dr. Mohamed Yunus, founder of the Grameen Bank, has specifically targeted female borrowers who he believes are the key to poverty alleviation. Children get uh, immediate benefit if the mother is a borrower. And women will have a longer vision about life and building up things so that they can move out of poverty. Uh, whereas men didn't pay much attention to the children as much as mother did. Uh, they are not as worried about future. Uh, they are more uh, trying to enjoy uh, right now. Grameen Bank, which was founded by Eunice in 1976, perfectly illustrates how microfinancing can incorporate more and more economic agents into the complex adaptive system by lifting them from poverty. As of October 2010, it had 8.3 million borrowers, 97% of whom were women. With 2,565 branches, the bank provides services in 81,373 villages, covering more than 97% of the total villages in Bangladesh. The Grameen Bank has been entirely financially sustainable, with no donor funds since 1998. In fact, the bank has earned a substantial profit each year since its founding, with the exception of only three years. 
In 2009, total profits amounted to $5.4 million. All interest rates are simple interest calculated on the declining balance method and loans are repaid in one week installments. This means if a borrower were to take an income generating loan of $100 and pay back the entire amount within a year in weekly installments, she will pay $110 in total, the equivalent to a 10% flat rate plus the original amount of the loan. Providing loans in this way ensures that borrowers will be able to repay, something that the local, unscrupulous loan sharks would not take into consideration when charging interest. To take out a loan from Grameen, borrowers must belong to a five-member group, but the responsibility of repayment rests on each member individually and there is no form of joint liability. The Grameen Bank, though focused on remaining financially sustainable and making profits, never puts its goal of poverty reduction very far from sight. Grameen remains concerned with borrowers' ability to repay loans, and therefore has reasonable interest rates and repayment periods. If a borrower is unable to repay within the agreed upon amount of time, new repayment periods can be negotiated, providing the reasons are valid. Finally, to receive a loan, borrowers must commit to 16 decisions designed to improve their overall social standing and well-being. These decisions are primarily intended to aid borrowers in raising themselves out of poverty. Most focus on building strong families by committing borrowers to grow their own vegetables, restrict family size, educate their children, build proper latrines, and purify water before they drink it. The rest of these decisions emphasize building community, obliging borrowers to help one another and not to do anyone injustice. The strong communities that result from the 16 decisions not only help raise individuals out of poverty, but they also provide added social pressure for repayment. Not coincidentally, the Grameen Bank boasts an impressive loan recovery rate of 97%. Though microcredit has enjoyed widespread popularity, the world of microfinance will have to address a number of challenges if it is to remain true to the goals of poverty alleviation and financial sustainability. Recently, it seems that many microfinance institutions have lost sight of Dr. Eunice's vision and have become more concerned with their ability to make profit than with their borrower's ability to meet payments. Ironically, the result is detrimental to both the poor and the microfinance institutions that extend these loans. To expand profit-generating activities, MFIs must reach more borrowers. In an effort to expedite this process, some MFIs, like India's Swayam Krishi Sanyam Fund, have cut their pre-loan training programs from multi-week courses on financial responsibility to mere four-hour long seminar. The purpose of these pre-loan training sessions is to educate borrowers so that they learn how to manage their personal assets. Without these rigorous programs, borrowers may find it more difficult to understand the terms of their repayment. To generate increased revenue, some MFIs have increased their interest rates or shortened repayment periods. Although the strategy appears profitable, the result is, in fact, the opposite. Facing higher interest rates and shorter repayment periods, many microcredit recipients are forced to default. This fact, combined with MFI's eagerness to expand, has led to an unsustainable pattern of overlending. Some MFIs have become too focused on their own growth and have become rather corrupt. In India, some microfinance executives have been paid more than those of India's largest commercial banks. Some MFIs have even been accused of engaging in coercive collection tactics that have resulted in over 50 suicides by borrowers. If MFIs want to remain financially sustainable and reduce poverty, they will need to act more responsibly in their profit-seeking strategies. They will need to adjust their policies so that borrowers will be able to repay their loans. If MFIs develop effective pre-loan training programs, establish reasonable payment periods, and are careful not to set interest rates too high, perhaps they will achieve the same high repayment rates that the Grameen Bank enjoys. Unlike other MFIs, the Grameen Bank has learned to balance its profit-making activities with the economic and social needs of its borrowers, allowing their business to stay afloat while still alleviating poverty. All in all, microfinancing done the right way holds tremendous potential for the future of the global economy as it effectively engages a demographic previously excluded from this complex adaptive system.